right, can everyone sit down? We're just about to get started again. Great, thanks everyone for, for taking your seats. Welcome back, I hope you're all refreshed and revived. Uh, and uh, please help me wel welcome uh, to the stage our panelists for the Providing Healthcare session. Uh, unfortunately, we found out this morning, uh, Stephen Lewis was not able to join us today. Something very urgent came up uh, at the last minute, so we're sorry to miss him, but uh, we've got a great group here um, as well. So if I could ask the, um, the panelists to, uh, to take the stage. And, uh, and our fa fabulous uh, moderator, Tony Barber. Well, thank you uh, so much for being here on this uh, beautiful day in Chicago. Uh, I'm so pleased to be back. I'm actually from Chicago, so yay, from Northbrook. <laughs> so uh, it's the first time I've been back in, I, I think, about 20 years. So it's been a really special opportunity for me to come back here as well and see the fascinating issues and uh, development goals and just the different changes we see in Chicago and how that sort of reflects the much wider challenges. And obviously today, there's an absolutely phenomenal group of panelists with me today to talk about one of those biggest issues, which is delivering healthcare in today's global cities. Um, this is an incredibly complex topic. It's a difficult topic. It's a topic which throws up many challenges in developing the kind of health infrastructure that our cities need. You have to rely on an incredibly diverse group of stakeholders. And you confront many challenges, the challenges that cities present, and we have issues of violence, of how women participate in the healthcare system, of crime, et cetera, that all throw up, throw up their unique issues involved. And so we're gonna try and have a really free-flowing <coughs> conversation here today, and uh, we want you guys to participate as much as possible, so we'll hopefully leave enough time for Q&A at the end, and please take advantage of that. When panels don't, I feel like we never get the best out of people, because sometimes the toughest questions come from you guys. And I wanted to introduce my, uh, my amazing panel here. So just here to my left, starting is Funmi Alapade. She's the um, Associate Dean for Global Health at the University of Chicago. We have Gary Slutkin, the founder and Chief Executive Officer of Cure Violence. Um, and finally, Harry Leiter, who is the uh, Chief Medical Officer and Global Vice President for Walgreens Boots Alliance. So this is gonna be a, a fascinating discussion. And I'm just gonna start off with some questions for our panelists first before we sort of um, delve into sort of calling everybody out on different topics. Uh, so Funmi, just turning to you first, I did also wanna mention, we did have Stephen Lewis on the panel, but he, uh, he I think they mentioned that, but so. Um, Funmi, I wanted to just talk to you about your role. You're obviously, you're a doctor, but you also have been involved intimately with a wide variety of global health initiatives. And then when we look at cities and sort of how they deal with developing healthcare, I wanted you to just look at first for us, what kind of people, what kind of diverse group of stakeholders that you need to make the kind of infrastructure we need for global cities work? And what's been your experience about who the key players are and what the key drivers of that are? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's really a great honor for me to be here to talk about uh, delivering healthcare in big cities because I've been in Chicago now for 32 years and I came from one of the mega cities, which is Lagos in Nigeria. And uh, so I had the opportunity to think about uh, what Lagos was like 32 years ago and what it is now, what Chicago was like 32 years ago, what it is now. And then I've traveled really to almost every continent looking at where people are and what's going on in global cities. Uh, the WHO has put together uh, sort of a roadmap for us by thinking about the global burden of disease. And uh, in 2011, the, the United Nations came together and said, you know, we all have to come together and tackle one of the most important epidemics that's sort of coming upon us, and that's the epidemic of chronic non-communicable conditions. So when you think about global health, when you think about cities, we tend to think about epidemics, 
and acute emergencies that we have to think about, disasters, tornadoes, you know, earthquakes. But people live in big cities and people are moving into big cities and they need healthcare over a lifespan from the time a child is born until the lifespan. And so what are some of the things that we really need to have? So as a medical doctor, my engagement with city dwellers is they come to see me in my office and then I'm trying to get them a prescription to keep them healthy. And as an oncologist, I'm trying to take care of their cancer. But I think before they ever come to see me, there are a lot of things that need to happen in neighborhoods, in communities. And so I would say that some of the stakeholders, really, in terms of healthy cities and healthy neighborhoods are the people, right? What do we need to get people to stay healthy in their own communities? So the neighborhoods, this, the, the most important, the physical environment, uh, do people have a place to go out and exercise, to walk without fearing that their children are going to be killed in parks? And when I first got to the city, to this city, Chicago, some of my patients who came to see me at the big hospital, at Cook County Hospital, couldn't ever even sit up in their living rooms because they're afraid that they're going to be shot because it, a, a, a gun might just fly through their, uh, their apartment. And then we started talking about actually reinvigorating the neighborhoods and getting jobs to people. So economic development in the neighborhoods, having jobs, having uh, 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 communities where they're vibrant, they're alive, they, there's good urban planning. That's the physical environment. The people have to contribute to that. Those are, the, I think, the most important stakeholders. And then beyond that, we're talking about education. We have programs in terms of really getting students to learn about health and well-being, to have good nutrition. So the schools really play a major role in terms of educating the population about their health. And then when it comes to delivering services, for individuals who actually need those services, whether it's young, uh, being able to get vaccinations to people where they live. And I know in global health settings, people have modeled different things. When I was growing up, vaccination used to take place in schools. While you had school health, you lined up everybody and you gave them vaccines. Now we're trying to do HPV vaccine, right? And we need to get young girls vaccinated. Well, if you delivered or sort of don't have stakeholders that will deliver vaccines to the girls who need them, guess what? We're not going to be able to eradicate cervical cancer. So I think we need to begin to think creatively about how we deliver uh, preventive services to people in the communities where they are. In this country, we still do vaccinations in doctor's offices. So if you don't have doctors in the neighborhood, how are children going to get vaccinated? Right? If you don't have community stakeholders who know that you should vaccinate your children against missiles, then we have missiles outbreak. Right? So we need parents, we need community uh, leaders to really organize some of these uh, 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 activities for us. And then, of course, in global health settings, we're talking about getting uh, 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 what, what we call task shifting. There are not enough doctors to do everything that we need to do. So are we, are we training enough nurses, enough public health nurses, enough uh, 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 pharmacists who are going to be able to talk to our patients about the drugs that we're giving them? So I think that really to really get cities to be healthy, we really must have a lot more people who are engaged in urban planning and in delivering services. Now, anyone who's gone to a big city will tell you that crime in big cities is a major problem. And so violence, and I know that we have one of my colleagues here who is going to be talking about violence in big cities. One of our challenges in Chicago is that people are afraid to go out at night. People are afraid to even go to their doctor's offices because they can't get out of their neighborhood. So we have to have safety, security. So when you ask me who are the stakeholders, there are a lot of people who are stakeholders, starting from the people who live in the communities, to the governments who are planning the cities, and then to physicians who work in hospitals or who work in practices, and then to nurses and other public health uh, care deliverers who actually make uh, cities uh, healthy. 
So I hope that's enough of the stakeholders. Yeah, that's, that's but uh, if I'm going to talk about uh, my role at the University of Chicago, what we really emphasize is that it takes an interdisciplinary team to make things work. We have to get economic development going bef before we can get healthy people in these communities and getting them to be vibrant communities. We're going to talk about many of those issues you just raised as this panel goes on. Um, but Gary, obviously you have a, a very good in there. I mean, you are the founder and the head of an organization that exactly as Finmi was talking about, uses sort of techniques of disease control to look at violence and violence as an epidemic and violence as a disease. And tell us a little bit more about that work and why it's so important to supporting and establishing a health infrastructure for major cities like Chicago, but like cities in you know, the developing world as well. Yeah, thank you, Megan, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. And I I'm thrilled to be here at the Chicago Council for Global Affairs, which I love. I love the Chicago Council and is bringing all this international conversation into Chicago, which I'm not so used to, but I'm so happy that it's here. So I, I, these are the cities that I've lived in. I've lived in Chicago and San Francisco and Washington and Mogadishu and um, Hargeisa, and I shuttled between Entebbe and Kampala and then uh, in Geneva in Switzerland. And um, I, I used to work at the World Health Organization where I spent a lot of time with um, a lot of uh, countries, in particular in uh, Central and East Africa when I was working on the AIDS epidemic. So my background, I'm a physician, epidemiologist, I'm tr my training is infectious diseases, and uh, most of what I was just uh, rattling off is work related to cholera and tuberculosis and uh, the AIDS uh, epidemic. So um, I came back to the United States um, quite a few years ago now and uh, without really knowing what to do. And with uh, time, I figured out that the people were telling me about these kids shooting each other. And it seemed like the problem was stuck like a lot of other problems and global health had been stuck forever. Malaria was stuck, diarrheal diseases were stuck. And of course, m most of the history of infectious diseases like leprosy and plague were stuck before we knew about infectious uh, invisible microorganisms. And so we just went about, myself and a few people, um, trying to redesign strategy for uh, violence. And um, we redesigned strategy and started to get some very, very strong results, and they've been replicated many times. And now it's cure, called Cure Violence, and Cure Violence is now um, operating in 25 cities in the U.S., in 60 sites, and also in many places in Latin America, including Mexico and Honduras, and also in the Middle East and South Africa. And um, in Kenya, and so this is like a new method. It's a health method. So what what is it about, really? What's going on here with respect to violence within health? Well, it's again violence. Has, it's emerging that there is a new understanding of it, and that it fits in health. And what do I mean by that? Well, for one thing, if you're affected by violence, you have, um, and this is the easy part of it. You you have like multiple times, four or five times, the rates of getting all kinds of cancers and heart disease and strokes and all of this, just from having been um, exposed to violence. So it's a health problem there. But the, the really significant uh, matter is that if you're exposed to violence, you're more likely to do violence. And that is the definition of a contagious disease, that it is a risk factor for itself. And so as we've begun to re-understand this, We've now like gone to the neuroscience people and we're going, whoa, there's something actually going on here in the brain that causes people to copy what other people are doing and causing people to um, require the approval of their friends and not be disapproved of by their friends and they've been traumatized so they're hyperreactive. And so the whole contagious stuff now has an invisible basis just like microorganisms were sitting around with, when we didn't know about it for people who have TB and cholera, and we used to think that these people were bad people, and we put them in dungeons or threw them down the well or dragged people, uh, w widows, around the <coughs> moat because we didn't understand what was really going on, so we thought they were bad people. So it turns out that when you see people on the news who have done something with respect to violence, I'm not talking about all things that people call crime. I'm talking about just violence, violent behavior. When you see they actually have a health problem, they have a contagious health problem. Now, the most important thing about knowing this, besides realizing 
that the mistreatment and the misdiagnosis of this has been leading to not always the best results, which has frustrated everybody forever, is that the, the health approach to this, which uses outreach workers and violence interrupters and does behavior change methods and shifts norms, um, actually gets between 40 and 70 percent drops in violence. And lo and behold, the Centers for, guess what, disease control has a Center for Violence Prevention. And the World Health Organization has a Division for Violence Prevention. And there's now a new set of methods that reduce violence. And Cure Violence has been leading on this, but a lot of people are picking this up. And it's very, very, very good news. I should tell you also with respect to how cities are operating with this. In this country, New York City Health Department is doing Cure Violence. I'm not talking about community groups, I'm talking about the health department of the city is doing cure violence. The health department of Baltimore is doing cure violence. By the way, the eastern part of Baltimore did not have the problems that the western part had, and there is a, a neighborhood there that's doing cure violence that is now just days away from having one year without any killings, and this is one of the most dangerous neighborhoods that exists. Um, the health department of Kansas City is now managing violence. And this is also becoming the case in some other countries as well. So this is, um, it's fitting in to health um, theoretically, it's fitting into health operationally, and scientifically now, I mean, the, the Institute of Medicine has really just formalized this in reviewing all the studies on its contagious nature and how to manage it. Harry, I want to pick up that point with you, obviously, as someone who spent a long time in Baltimore. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> with, we were just talking about that before we came out. But also as someone who is not perhaps traditionally thought of as on the front line of healthcare when we're talking about confronting violence or we're talking about some of these other, you know, epidemic type of issues. But what role do you feel the private sector brings and what unique challenges do they face? And they actually are on the front line of delivering this and creating this infrastructure as well. But what are the challenges you face as well? Sure, in and to I that? want to thank the council for the opportunity and thank you, Megan. Um, I agree a lot with what my colleagues said about the need to have services in the community. And I think the really big opportunity for the private sector is to um, offer access and convenience to citizens of cities. Um, for someone who has a job that they can't miss a day of work, or a parent who's taking care of a child, the idea of going to see a doctor for a minor illness or even a fairly significant illness and taking a half day out of their lives could be the difference between making enough money to have a good livelihood or, or a, a child missing days of much needed days of school. So I think the opportunity for private sector companies like Walgreens, and now we're a global company uh, called Walgreens Boots Alliance, um, is to really come up with solutions in the community. Um, so a couple statistics, and this is not an infomercial for Walgreens at all. But because we've grown so big, 65% of the population lives within three or four miles of a Walgreens in the United States. 65? 65%. 50% uh, of our 8,300 and some stores are in medically underserved communities. So we think of about perhaps here in Chicago, Walgreens being on the, in the Gold Coast, which is only blocks from here in an affluent neighborhood. But half of our stores are actually in neighborhoods like the south side of Chicago that are medically underserved, where there aren't traditional providers and doctors free, you know, available. Fume mentioned immunizations, which is such a huge public health issue. And we administered 7 million immunizations last year, mostly flu. But now, because of that, you can go into almost any drugstore and get your immunizations for adolescents and for adults. Generally, um, retail stores don't give uh, pediatric immunizations because we're concerned about fragmenting care. In other words, having pediatricians feel that they're not following a young child you know, con in a continuous way. But I think what the, re what the private sector can do is use capital and deploy resources to make care more accessible. Just to get you thinking, a couple statistics that might, you might find interesting. The average doctor's visit 
in the U.S. just for a routine visit, nothing, not a complicated visit, but a routine visit, probably costs about $100. So if you have health insurance, and with healthcare reform, more people do, but not everybody, if you have health insurance, you might pay $25 of that, a copay. If you're early in the year and you're in the, does everybody know what the deductible phase is, right? That part of the year where you're paying out of your pocket, unfortunately. And most people's health plans these days have deductibles that are like $3,000 or $4,000. A doctor's visit could be $100 out of your pocket. Seeing a nurse practitioner in a retail store like a Walgreens or a CVS in a retail clinic generally costs about $60 or $70. And you can do that and get in and out maybe in about a half hour and not miss, miss work. Another statistic you might find interesting is that I'm a primary care doctor, I'm an internist, and I've seen a lot of patients early in my career that had diabetes, which is, by the way, is one of the four big epidemics we're facing in developed countries, which are obesity, diabetes, um, cancer, and then Alzheimer's are, are some of the big ones that we really need to worry about. But we hope as a primary care doctor that you'll see a diabetic patient two to four times a year. Those are the guidelines. You prefer four if you can. The average diabetic comes to a pharmacy 20 times per year to pick up a prescription. So if you think about the opportunity of a pharmacist to help with coaching around health behaviors and to advise patients not only about their medications but about things like exercise and stopping smoking and these lifestyle issues that we're talking about, it's a tremendous lever to improve health care. And that's why I actually came to uh, work in this job uh, two years ago and, and moved to Chicago because it, I, the opportunity to do what we call population health, but to do it in the community with 25,000 pharmacists and several thousand nurses and all these facilities across the country now across the globe. So I think the opportunity for uh, the private sector is to solve these issues around access, convenience, and affordability at scale where you can deliver these solutions uh, across large populations in countries across the world. Okay, great, thanks. I wanna, um, there's been one sort of theme that for me, and it's probably because I write for the Financial Times, <laughs> that sort of emerges that is one early common strand. And for me, you discussed it about economic development and inequality that sort of cuts across what we're talking about, access, about affordability, about addressing <coughs> these issues. And, one thing that stood out for me is just how vital the economic development aspect is in terms of addressing healthcare. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you see as models or model programs, model uh, scenarios that can help sort of jumpstart economic development, that reduce inequality and that improve access, that reduce violence, that, you know, that that can be a core building block of developing the kind of health infrastructure we need to see? Yeah, so, you know, I. I love Chicago, and I have, there have been a lot of experiments that we've done in Chicago that's actually uh, making the city a much more vibrant city. And I, I use the example of our beloved Chicago Bulls. Um, I started my career at Cook County Hospital on the west side of Chicago, and the neighborhood was not anywhere you would want to walk past 6 p.m. And then, the city decided to build the stadium on the west side of Chicago. And all of a sudden, it became the most vibrant neighborhood to go to because all the uh, fancy restaurants started opening on the way to watch the Chicago Bulls play basketball. The neighborhood got gentrified and all of a sudden, Walgreens was there, <laughs> and some of the best restaurants in Chicago are there. And now, in fact, a lot of young people have moved back to the city to live on the near west side, right? Because of having a hub of economic development on the west side of Chicago. We're excited that we're gonna have the Obama Presidential Library on the south side of Chicago as a way to anchor economic development on the south side of Chicago. The University of Chicago is the largest employer of people on the south side of Chicago because it's a research center and it has a hospital there. But it's the only major hospital that has to take care of a vast uh, uh, number of people who live on the south side of Chicago. And we can't do everything. 
So there are other smaller hospitals that are working there. But if you look at how healthcare has been distributed in this city, there's been such gross inequity. And that's why when you look at per capita, the number of doctors that are on the north side of Chicago, where people with insurance and who have you know, great money have, and you see the numbers of doctors who have to serve people on the south side of Chicago, you see the huge inequity in the way resources are distributed in our city. We sent our medical students out to go and ask primary care doctors on the south side, if a woman wanted a mammogram, where would they go? And it turned out that the primary care doctors working on the south side of Chicago could not name a stable location where women would get a mammogram on the south side of Chicago. No wonder the south side of Chicago has the highest, one of the highest mortality rate from breast cancer. A black woman in this city is twice as likely to die from breast cancer than a white woman. And that's just because of the way women access healthcare. And so I think that some of the economic development that needs to happen is to actually have vibrant communities where there are jobs, where there are hospitals, community health centers. Uh, for a very long time, we didn't have community health centers on the south side of Chicago. And now because of some of the federally mandated uh, uh, policies, we now have community-based health centers. And so I think that number one, when people have money, they can buy a lot. We also found out that in fact, sometimes there were what we call food deserts. So you're diabetic and I've told you, you needed to have you know, good nutrition, to uh, eat lots of fruits and vegetables, but there are no stores in your neighborhood where you can get fresh fruits and vegetables. So I think some of the really important things that we need to talk about when we're talking about cities and we're th talking about the inequities is we've got to figure out how to really put resources in the poorest neighborhoods to actually get people in those neighborhoods to have jobs and to be able to have good schools where they can actually want the same thing that we all want, which is to stay out of hospitals. <laughs> Absolutely. I just want to mention that it's not only the Bulls that play at that stadium, which is particularly relevant this week, go Blackhawks. Um, <laughs> game seven coming up. Uh, Gary, how much is economic development and sort of addressing that issue vital to what you guys are trying to do and addressing that component and trying to boost people out of a level of poverty, a level of deprivation where violence is so common? Yeah, so um, this is another instance where what might be intuitive turned out to not be the case. And it took um, the World Bank about, uh, to their own admission, about 40 years to figure this out. That is to say, so what is the World Bank's mission? It has something to do with um, alleviating poverty and, um, and economic development. But they about, I think it's about eight or 10 years ago, um, came to the conclusion that there has not been success in economically developing your way out of violence. And that the way um, out of uh, violence is to reduce the violence, and then economic development is allowed. And this is largely the, the work of Paul Collier. I mean, yes, you can put a stadium somewhere, or you can put, you know, and the people then move. They, they're, yeah, but actually, the next neighborhoods don't benefit much. And I'm not knocking Chicago, this is like many cities in, in Latin America, too and in, in places even where you know, there's more of a social um, desire and um, where the social policies are you know, more um, towards trying to really do improvements and inequities and things like that. But, um, and so, as a result, and this is Paul Collier's work and he summarizes it in the bottom billion uh, in that book. And as a result of that, the World Bank is now saying you know, that we are taking on uh, we're going to take on reducing violence, which is something that they avoided, you know, a lot forever, but it, it became unavoidable. And, um, and they, they just were uh, without the experiences 
They just were out, they were trying forever to economically develop while there was violence that couldn't happen. But when wars would stop, or when violence would reduce, or when populate, when the susceptible popula, you know, when there was exhaustion of war, and then, and it stopped, or then um, the grass could grow, when the fire was out, the grass could grow again. And so this is um, actually the new way of thinking. And it, it not only relates to economic development, it relates to most of the other things that Fumni was talking about, because the violence is keeping people in chronic stress disorders, in trauma, they're not going, the teachers aren't staying in those neighborhoods, you know, the kids can't concentrate, they'll tell you that, you know, they're worried about what's gonna happen after school, and um, I don't know if Walgreens is everywhere really, but you know, most stores aren't coming into these neighborhoods, right. most businesses are not coming into these neighborhoods. So in terms of health outcomes, in terms of business, economic development outcomes, educational outcomes, you know, it's just, it's not happening when there's violence. But the good news about this is, just like, you know, some of these other um, processes, you can um, approach them, you can approach it directly and get good results and then open the way. And we actually saw this in, so, in, in a few neighborhoods where, you know, suddenly people are walking and getting businesses coming back and things like that, and we've seen this in quite a few cities now. Did you want to pick up a yeah, point on that? Yeah, you know, one of the things I wanted to, to actually mention is when you think about violence, um, so in cities when you're having uh, violence in terms of the um, gun violence and the fact that pe there's so much in inequity and people steal, people come in. I, I, I remember when I first got to the city and the image of Chicago was a place where you couldn't come to because there was so much violence. But there's been a lot of work that's been done in terms of, uh, you know, community policing uh, to make communities safer and a lot of things that people are doing to reduce violence in neighborhoods. Even the, in some neighborhoods where people take ownership of making sure that they protect their neighborhood. Now, we've said a lot about the kinds of violence you might find in a city like Chicago. But another type of violence that I've seen that actually is allowing, that has ceased and is allowing economic development across Africa is all these wars and political instability. So one of the things that I really think is very important when we talk about stakeholders making life better for people is good governance in places where there hasn't been democracy. And I came out of Lagos, Nigeria, and out of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa because the economic conditions across Sub-Saharan Africa was becoming Im impossible for anybody to have good livelihood because we have political instability in almost every African country with military dictatorship and no good governance. And if you look at some of the fastest growing economies that we're talking about now, they're in sub-Saharan Africa, where people are actually trying to develop themselves by voting, and Nigeria is gonna change over and have another governor, another government starting tomorrow. And if you look at how the economic prediction is, is that these countries, by being more stable, are gonna be able to develop their cities, and all that has happened when there hasn't been wars and military dictators having military coups upon military coups across sub-Saharan Africa. That is economic development that's allowing people to come out of poverty, that's allowing us to be able to even tackle some of the problems with AIDS, HIV. And I think some of those things are actual examples of economic policies that are working but they're not sustainable unless you can actually create jobs. And so some of the things that people are talking about is that you need to invest in these countries where we've put aid in, into previously, where you are actually investing and developing businesses that will help these countries and these cities to actually be able to uh, sustain the people who are going into those cities. So I think the question of, you know, curing violence, uh, helping people to stay healthy by getting them out of poverty has to have multiple ways and multiple people who are engaged, multiple stakeholders. But for it to be sustainable, 
you have to have private enterprise. And that's what I mean by investing in communities and bringing businesses to communities so people can actually make money and be able to spend money in their own communities. Harry, I want to pick this up with you because I want to ask, and I don't, I don't want to put you on the spot on this, but Gary mentioned a little bit about saying, you know, there aren't Walgreens in this neighborhood. Do you think as an organization you're a leader or a follower? I mean, can you lead and make change in terms of access to health care in some of these neighborhoods that are so yeah. racked well, by the Yeah, well, I actually, you know, just to level set the discussion, we, as I said, we have um, of our 8,300 and some stores, 50% are in medically underserved areas, which are generally inner cities, uh, low, ec low socioeconomic areas. Um, uh, I was just, I gave a commencement speech to a group of pharmacy students who were graduating yesterday in Harlem. And uh, not only uh, Walgreens, but our competitors also have stores uh, in Harlem in very, very challenging neighborhoods. And frankly, oftentimes it is the drug stores that are, are the only place you can get food. And we have stores that we call food oases, which is the Cure, you know, the uh, response to a food desert because people can't go to a supermarket because it might be five miles away because it's not in their neighborhood. But something, uh, I want to amplify something Gary said because uh, we had something happen in Baltimore that most of you know about or many of you know about, which was the violence accompanying the death of the young man in Baltimore um, provoked tremendous amount of violence. And one of the responses, unfortunately, by some members of the community was to set fire to a CVS pharmacy. And I know where that pharmacy is located. It's in a very disadvantaged area, very challenged area. We happen to have stores not far away. So your comments really resonated with me because if we don't deal with the violence, it's very hard for private enterprise, for the private sector, to make the investments that we would like to, to serve that population. So it is a cyclical issue, but that said, um, our, our uh, organization, as well as our competitors, have really invested very, very significantly in, in putting facilities in uh, very, very challenging neighborhoods, can especially I, can here I, in Chicago <clears throat> and the South Side. I, I want to add something to this. You know, Harry's competitor, unnamed, which is CVS, I think. <laughs> the, the, the competitor that yeah. should not be named. Right. Yes. Yeah. Which had the, yeah. Right. Which is CVS. And the, um, I thought we weren't going to name it. Right, <laughs> but I, I, uh, I know the history of that to a certain extent, that that was um, something on the order of 10 or 12 years of the work of government and the community right. begging, struggling, trying to get investors companies, unnamed companies, to get in there. It wasn't as if they proactively went in there. Yeah. I mean, so all the more tragic, but it really was not an automatic that they would go there. It was very, very, very hard yeah. to get them to go in there. I know yeah. this. And, and, you know, what will happen next, we'll see. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't know much about CVS, and I don't, you know, we don't like to name them. But anyway, just all kidding aside, uh, since we're basing this conversation in Chicago, Walgreens was founded in the city in Chicago, the first store was built here. So the natural expansion, at least in this city, was in all the neighborhoods, because it was Chicago that was first. I think CVS is a little bit of a different history. But um, I can tell you that people are very brave who work in some of these neighborhoods. And some of the stores are 24-hour stores. They're open all night. I mean, it takes a certain kind of individual and a certain amount of commitment to serve the community to want to, be, to, want to work in some of these, these neighborhoods and uh, a lot of dedicated people. And, and, and they're not just the pharmacists. They're oftentimes the clerks who make $12 an hour, the pharmacy techs who don't make a lot of money. It's not just, you know, the pharmacists and the nurses who earn a good wage. Yeah. I just want to say something that, you know, for even for these neighborhoods that we say have the most violence, they also have people who live there who need to be served. And this is why one of the most important things that we need to consider in sort of developing and putting services in is we have to have what we call community engagement. And what, when we have gone to the communities to have focus groups and to ask, truly ask, what do you want in Woodlawn or in some of the South Side Chicago's, uh, 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 South Side neighborhoods? They want exactly the same thing that we all want. They want to be able to have a park. They want to be able to 
walk, and there are people who will take care of things that you bring to their neighborhood. So that's why it's very important to have a diverse workforce. Okay, we have found, and there was a very nice article in the New York Times last week, talking about having more black doctors who want to work in black neighborhoods, right? They are not afraid to work there, but when in fact there are no hospitals or no places to put your office in, you can't be a lone ranger working in that hospital. So some of the innovative things that I see happening, for example, at the University of Chicago, we have students who want to make house calls. We have students who want to do community health and want to, uh, uh, as part of being a doctor, want to be a doctor in the South Side neighborhood. They would like to be able to have a Walgreens that their patients can go to. So I think it's a cyclical uh, 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 issue where you think there's neighborhood and because of that you can't go there. So part of what we need to do and some of the stakeholders that actually need to be able to solve the problem of all of the big cities is that you need diversity. We need to embrace the diversity mm -hmm. and we need to use that diversity to think outside the box in terms of solving the problems of these neighborhoods. And so what happens, at least I have been in Chicago for 32 years, is that we discuss about the problems in the neighborhood without even ever having stepped foot in the neighborhood. And so you can't develop services when you don't know the people you are developing services for. The same thing in the global health setting. You can't solve the problem of Lagos, unless you've been to Lagos and you engage the stakeholders in Lagos to start to, to figure out how to deliver services to people who live in Lagos. So I think it's really one of the things that we believe is that you have to have community engagement, you have to have partnerships within the community to be able to actually deliver services and improve the health of these communities. Megan, I, I'd yeah. like to just build Please, on. Go ahead. I, I, I just want to talk hand. about um, health infrastructure a little bit in, in this sector, because I mean, what what is being described here is almost like the absence of. So there, some of the physicians need to go into the neighborhood, and then there's physicians who are in tertiary centers like UFC, where I trained, and and Walgreens is now serving like as part of the health infrastructure. Right. Why? Because of the absence of a health infrastructure and because of the weakness of the health sector. And so what we have here is, in, in mostly in the world, we have ministries of health, that, of which you know, they're being run um, not by the president's brother, but by his like, third nephew or cousin or something. You know, so it's really very delegated, inferior positioning. You have health uh, departments in the US that don't have nearly the interaction with mayors that, for example, police departments and planning and finance ministries or departments have. And this is, um, this is really a, a giant problem, is because the work of the health sector is doing the invisible work, frankly, of keeping TB away, of keeping um, diarrheal diseases down, of keeping the vaccine-preventable diseases down. I mean, it's, it, just take Ebola, for example. As, um, Ebola shows up all the time in Uganda but they, they have health workers and they squash it. They know what to do. There's no health infrastructure in Monrovia or Freetown, why? Because of war, but anyway, they might not have invested in it in the first place, and then it became, went into the cities, completely destroyed these cities for like years, frankly. And so, um, and that's, you know, as far as Chicago goes, you know, you don't have this health worker network, but you're, you have it good enough you have it good enough to keep the major diseases down, but not all, I mean, Baltimore, for example, you know, they were, they were dependent on police yep. to try to prevent something rather than, you know, a, a network, a, a health worker network. Yep. It's, you know, the violence interrupters, the outreach workers, um, the hospital responders who are part of the Cure Violence Network, it's a health worker system. And that's what you know, really allows the resilience. I mean, throughout Latin America, in Asia, you know, health workers are all over the place. Lagos also, by the way. Lagos had, yeah, I mean, it's not all over the place. This is a, a, a city that is like unimaginable in terms of its size, complexity, and crowding like Johannesburg. They yeah. had a few cases. Mm. Yeah, but actually, 
think they about, were able to control it. Yeah, think about Ebola. Let's talk about Ebola, for example. That's a, you know, that's one thing that we, everybody in, that lives in a city will be devastated if there was an epidemic that we couldn't control. And that's why having a really robust public health system that can respond to such an emergency is so important. So we live in a global village where one airplane ride away from SARS. Do you remember SARS? It was, you know, Toronto, you know, Asia, and everybody thought, you know, this was going to be a major devastation. It actually was, it caused significant economic disruption when we had to tackle SARS in the big cities. Ebola, talking about violence and war, We've been doing work in Liberia for the last, you know, five, uh, ten years because it's a post-war, post-conflict country, and our emergency room physicians have been going to train physicians in Liberia to help them develop their health infrastructure, and Sierra Leone and those smaller countries in West Africa. However, when Ebola came to Lagos, because there was actually a public health infrastructure that worked, mm and because there was resources and money. And guess what? I went to Lagos just as they were dealing with the Ebola epidemic. And do you know the stakeholders who came to control the Ebola in Lagos? Yeah, there were people in the public health sector, the person from the Ministry of Health, but there were people in businesses that didn't want their business to shut down, who got hand sanitizers, who got you know, uh, 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 a way to get people quarantined. Mm. I saw the, the telephone uh, 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 companies giving uh, uh, ambulances, giving cell phones, and telling the ministries of health, we'll fund the cell phones, just make sure people stay at home and they don't come out. So there's a lot of stakeholders that have to function in a city to take care of emergencies and to also make sure that the city works. So that's a good example of a mega city that was able to squash Ebola because there was an infrastructure in place. And this infrastructure in Lagos was built in the 80s um, by Ransom Kuti, who was the Minister of Health then. No. So I want to turn to Harry on this just for a second. There's a sort of a little bit of a debate here in terms of what does make, you know, what is the infrastructure? Do we have, are like Walgreens filling in gaps of an sure, infrastructure that sure. is weaker than it should be? I mean, should that be the sure. role? Or, and, well, I, I was, as Gary was talking, I was starting to take a little bit of exception to his comment, and then he sort of pivoted to healthcare workers. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think I uh, disagree with maybe the front end and totally mm. agree with the back end. Mm. I think when it comes to having an infrastructure to deal with uh, public health threats like serious communicable diseases, uh, I, I think I totally agree, and we're all on this, I think, on the same page that the United States and many countries don't have the developed kind of system that we really need. Uh, that leverages um, minimally trained healthcare workers and that you don't need physicians to do all this kind of work. You need a network that's large, mobile, out in the community, even in rural areas, especially when you're dealing with diseases like tuberculosis. On the other hand, the notion that we need an infrastructure of physicians, it'd be interesting to see what my colleagues have to say. I think, Fume, you started to comment on that. We don't need a broad infrastructure of physicians to do everything. And the fact that we can have a pharmacist measures someone's blood pressure and find that they have really bad hypertension and could have a stroke in the next month or two and identify serious hypertension, or have a technician measure someone's hemoglobin A1C and find out that someone who didn't know it has diabetes, or that we can be doing immunizations uh, in the community. I think in many cases uh, what uh, we've done and what our competitors have done is an infrastructure of sorts that provides access uh, convenience and care at a much lower price point than the traditional system. So I think we have to be a little more nuanced and refined when we say we don't have infrastructure about what services we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And now the last point I'd like to make is, about this is that with health care reform, um, CMS, the federal government, a branch for Medicare and Medicaid here in the United States, has for the first time in history made a public goal that within the next few years they're going to move 50% and then eventually 80% of the reimbursements to providers, hospitals, and the physicians 
based on quality metrics, not just fee for service. So in other words, the traditional system always was the more you did, the more surgeries or the more visits, the, the more money that was paid out to doctors and hospitals. But the whole system is being converted so that not only is it how much you do, but it's whether you actually do quality work. Well, for the first time, there's now major incentives being put on hospitals and doctors to make sure that patients stay on their medications, to make sure that they get vaccinated, to screen for diabetes, to screen for high blood pressure, to finish the immunization treatments uh, like for HPV. So there's this economic incentive for the traditional providers and hospitals and doctor's offices to collaborate with organizations like ours so that they hit these quality goals and actually get more compensation. So the first time in my 25-year career, we actually have an economic environment that's starting to align the incentives where different elements of the system need to work together. So we have hospitals reaching out to us all the time asking can our retail clinics with our nurse practitioners support the physicians in the hospital after hours and on weekends to keep people out of the emergency room and to provide services. And we have medical groups reaching us, out to us and saying, can you deliver medications at the bedside and counsel our patients when they go back home so we can prevent them from being readmitted? Because there's economic incentives around that for hospitals. They get penalized now if patients come back into the hospital within 30 days. So I think this web of, a web of infrastructure for certain services really is starting to come together and we're part of the solution, working with doctors and hospitals and other healthcare providers. But I couldn't agree more when you're talking about things like communicable diseases. That's a different kind of infrastructure and with violence it certainly is as well. I want to turn to focus on something that I wanted to talk about given this panel, which is women. And for me, you've touched a little bit on it. But I want to go a little bit deeper into the unique challenges that women face, also obviously violence against women, but sort of women as the focal point of the home, but also women in terms of access, women in terms of challenges they face in poor neighborhoods, et cetera, and how important it is in building this you know, relationship between stakeholders of having women involved at every level from the home, from provider, from doctor, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, th there's actually been a lot of uh, innovative thoughts around women's health and how we can actually deliver an integrated approach to women's health. So whether it's in a rich home or a poor home, women are the purveyors of health care, right? You know, we know that men don't want to go to the doctor, but their wives drive them there. So every hospital right. markets to women, right. <laughs> right? I'm sure Walgreen knows that. That's, you know. We do. <laughs> right? And so the question is, can you really empower women and get them really driving uh, health care? And so when we talk about integrating women's health, the first thing that we have to think about is, when do women actually access health care? First, it's around childbirth. So globally, we're talking about women's health and women's reproductive health. And one of the things that's sort of been a, a dividing issue for women's health is that there have been a lot of people who are advocates for women's health who have been stuck on women's reproductive issues. And so globally, we're divided by people who believe women should have contraceptives or have abortion or don't have abortion. And so as a result of that, people haven't actually thought about what women need across the lifespan. So we find that in fact, it's important to think about, you know, not having unwanted pregnancies because that's one of the reasons why women die globally, especially when you have teenage pregnancies. So how do we solve that, okay? We know that when women want to go in and have a simple childbirth, I remember when I was in medical school, I never wanted to get pregnant because I thought, why would I risk my life trying to bring a life into this world? However, as soon as I got to the United States, I wanted to have 10 children because it was so easy to have a child in the US, right? <laughs> and so thinking about women all over the world and thinking about their needs across the lifespan, there are many issues surrounding women's health. And if they don't have access to good uh, prenatal care, uh, if women are anemic, then they die during childbirth. And those are some of the really challenging things that we need to take care of in global cities. How do women access care? 
And then when the access care, that's why there's been really uh, policies around making sure that every birth is attended, right? There are many women who are giving birth on the way to, the, to, to, to work or who are giving birth and don't have anyone to attend them. So the WHO and a lot of people involved in women's health have been focused on that. The question of high blood pressure, we know that there's sometimes during pregnancy when women develop high blood pressure and then that blood pressure stays with them and it becomes a problem of chronic disease that they have to manage all through their lifestyle. So having a Walgreens where a woman can actually go in while they're doing their well baby check, somebody is checking their blood pressure, somebody is checking to make sure they don't have a high blood pressure, they're not stressed, you know, global mental health, postpartum depression, these are all things that happen to women. Sure. And if we can actually integrate some of these services where women are provided with opportunities to talk to counselors, to have them, you know, less stresses in life, then we think that women who are healthier are going to be happier, they're going to be uh, able to participate in economic development, and they're gonna be able to help their families. That's why my work trying to help women who have breast cancer all over the world is such an important work because we know that these women who have survived childbirth, who are now in their middle ages, are now the ones who are getting breast cancer and they don't have access to care. And so when a woman dies prematurely, it really devastates the family. The children are not able to accomplish all they need, they can possibly accomplish. So I really am, think that when you're thinking about cities and you're thinking about how we uh, provide access to healthcare, we have to look at women across the continuum. And if we just focus on women, all the problems will be solved. <laughs> well, as, as, the par as the parent of a three-month-old baby, I'm not quite sure with the description as easy. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I'm not sure we're quite there yet. Uh, Gary, I wanted to sort of your thoughts on this and how important this component of addressing violence against women and violence that is more specific to women is. Well, I mean, it, it couldn't possibly be more important. I just want to add a few things to um, what uh, Fumni said. So we use these words, um, access and availability at World Health. And availability means that you know, it's uh, within range, it's possible you could go there, the Walgreens or a clinic is a few blocks away and so on. But accessibility really means is it, um, you feel like being there. You know, are the people um, treating you nice when you go in? Is it there at the time that you really need it? You know, if, if you're in Rwanda, is, you know, as you're waiting in the sun or in the shade, you know, these kinds of things. And so that is um, about how services are designed. So Walgreens is nice because, I mean, it's on the corner in a lot of places, and you don't even have to, I suppose, let your husband or boyfriend know. And I don't even know the conditions of confidentiality and everything else there. But that's extraordinarily important, too. But that's just about the care um, part of this. Um, there, you know, what, um, what we've really learned in women's health issues, and in particular these were giant lessons in family planning and also giant lessons in HIV AIDS, is there's something that has to be dealt with with respect to the men because they are in the way or causing a lot of the problems. And so um, there have been like decades, these were actually two problems that were also very, very heavily stuck on trying to reach women. Um, when the men weren't talked to. I remember in, in my office at World Health when um, Susan Allen came in crying. She had the most effective HIV program in the world in Rwanda and Kigali and been dropping rates, and, but she couldn't get it any further and then suddenly they started to talk to the men and the rates like dropped another 70%. So, you know, a lot of women are in relationships, they're in dyadic relationships and we have to talk to the men. And in particular, when we're talking about sexual violence, it really, or any kind of violence against women, it isn't, you know, I don't even know why we say, you know, my wife brings this point up, why do we keep saying violence against women? We keep t focusing about on the woman instead of saying male violence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or male violence against women, you know, putting it where it is. 
So you know, just from you know, just to put point the picture here about Norm. So the the, the woman comes home, and um, she comes home a little bit later, and the man beats her, and um, and then he goes to the barber shop the next day, and he says, you know, well, she came home late. Well, I, I hope you taught her a lesson. Or he goes to a different barber shop, and they say, you did what? And see, that's what social norms are about. So there's possibilities. Our workers in neighborhoods, in this city, in Baltimore, in many cities, they're primarily trained for reducing violence, shootings and killings and things like that. But because of the trust and the credibility, they're called into all these other situations that are going on that it's all mixed up with. Just like war is all mixed up with sexual violence. So the same principles about the need for men to interrupt men and for men to change the norms of men, as well as all the protection stuff for women, the, the, we have to deal with that. And that's, and that's when we're getting results. And we're getting results when we're really interacting with the men. Whether it's family planning, sexual violence, or HIV AIDS, it's the men who have to change, fundamentally change. That is definitely and they are not changed by telling them that they're wrong or this or that or punishing them and all this stuff and threatening them. They are primarily being driven by what they think their friends think. So if their friends think that you don't do that or if their friends are stopping them, whether we're talking about a fraternity or sorority house or whether we're talking about a school or after school. I mean, we changed the sexual, the Ugandans changed the sexual mores about the relationships between teachers and um, girls, and the military and police and girls, by changing the way the men interacted with them um, in terms of what the expectations were. And this is what we do in the health sector, not the law enforcement sector. This is what we do in the health sector. We change. You know, I mean, by the way, I don't. I can't help noticing that nobody's smoking. And so when I was um, in um, medical school watching angiograms of people with heart disease and heart attacks, a third of us were smoking. And so what's happened? What would happen if somebody smoked? He's like, what are you doing? We don't do that anymore, right? There's a new, and it's invisible now. It's like locked in. And so that's like the end game on the changing of the norms of the men. Yeah. Just smoking then. Here, I want to give you a, a shot at this one as well before we move to questions because you're going to have some time, some questions. I mean, I know you guys look at the woman as the head of the household, as right, you mentioned, absolutely. and are tapping into this, but yeah. what, you know... Well, first I have to tell a joke that relates to something Gary said. I am um, married. Uh, I have two daughters. Uh, one just graduated college a year ago. One's in college. I have a neuter dog. So I wake up in the morning and say, I'm sorry, what did I do wrong? <laughs> Uh, it, it plays all better in certain audiences, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, just a, a more male. Of <laughs> <laughs> uh, clearly, uh, from our perspective, it's much like uh, Fume and Gary said, um, women are the, uh, the CEOs of healthcare for their families. Uh, they make the decisions, they purchase the products, they get the, the kids to come in for immunizations when they're the appropriate age. They uh, buy products for their uh, significant others. Um, men are not proactive about this at, at all. And, it, and, it, and that cuts across socioeconomics, actually. You know, you would think that people that have more money or more educated that, that men will become more involved, and, and they really aren't. So we, we do a lot of work uh, with um, creating uh, formats to educate women about health care, about things like vaccination and smoking cessation and diabetes and all sorts of things because we know that if we can provide education uh, and support to women, it will um, hopefully affect their families as well. Uh, a way we're doing that today and trying to get around some of the barriers around uh, the entire family is digitally. And even though perhaps men may not come into our stores or our clinics as much as we would like, uh, we're now having millions of our consumers interacting with us on their cell phones or their iPads or their computer. And one of the interesting things we've done, and this seems to be working with, uh, with, with across genders, is we're giving people what's called balance rewards points. 100 million Americans have these loyalty cards, these balance rewards cards. So we're actually giving points to people for walking, you can measure that with a Fitbit or a device that we have or any of those devices. For, we give people points for weighing themselves. We give folks points for committing to quit smoking, making a pledge to quit smoking, 
for uploading your sugars if you're a diabetic automatically when you measure it with a meter. And these points, as you may know, are worth uh, real money for purchases in stores. So I think one of the ways we're trying to get around this issue of uh, men and children maybe not being, or younger folks not being as involved in their health care is to try to use technology as an attractive way to get people engaged in their health care. And uh, I think to date we've had about 25 million miles walked and recorded by people uh, using devices and earning points. We have 250,000 people buying digital blood pressure scales and blood pressure cuffs and scales to track things. So I don't want to go too deep into it, but uh, women are critically important, but I do think the whole world of digital health is providing us a way to um, get past the traditional barriers of getting to much uh, broader uh, groups of, uh, of patients and consumers. I didn't know about that. I need to get a Walgreens card and go walking. <laughs> yeah, right. I did say I would leave some time for questions, and we do have, we've got about, uh, you know, oh, some ones come up on the screen. I don't know if that's allowed because no one even raised their hand. I feel like that's unfair, but uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to go to the person raising their hand. So I'll go to you right there. No, you, yes, you right there first. Yes. Thank you. Um, my name is Kathy Tate Bradish. This question is really for Gary Slutkin. I wonder if you could tell us just a little about where your cure violence has been the most effective and why you think that is, why you think that city probably helped with it, and then what's with Chicago? And I know you're having excellent luck in some neighborhoods, but are you getting pushback? Can we in this room help? Um, and what, what could other cities learn a little bit from where you've had your successes? Well, there, there's, um, there's been a lot of success in Chicago. Actually, the evidence base for cure violence in Chicago is probably stronger than in any other city. I mean, there was, uh, a study of seven years of work with a 10-year baseline with four different statistical methods done by four universities funded by the Department of Justice in this city showing 40 to 70 percent drops in shootings and killings, 50 percent drops in hot spots, 100 percent reduction in um, retaliations in the setting of a murder in five neighborhoods, and in, in our confidential interviews showing that these workers were the most important people in these guys' lives, and these guys were shooters, and, um, and that they were well on their way to all these other good things in their life, et cetera. And there's been two other sets of evaluations <coughs> in this city. And likewise, Johns Hopkins and CDC did evaluations getting 30 to 50 percent drops in Baltimore, and New York City has um, results too. So the, if we're getting 50% drop in San Pedro Sula, also Puerto Rico, also Cape Town. Um, and there's other, um, like actually in some places in Honduras, it's more than that, it's a lot more than that. In, ba in East Baltimore now, there's a place, as I said, where it's nearly a year without any um, killing, and it was a, a tough. So, you know, what, what is success? Is it reductions in shootings and killings, or is, a city, or is it a city adapting the model? I mean, New York City tripled um, the uh, cure violence approach a year ago. There was no, there was no um, communication strategy. There's no political strategy. I mean, it was um, the decision of the government to do that. And, um, and they're getting good, good results in a lot of places. I mean, the, the pushback on this approach is, the, is principally is understandable. I mean, it's a disruptive technology. It's a new method. I mean, it's... Um, it, 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 Push, it pushes back on the conventional idea that people are bad people, that they need to be taught a lesson, and that we are serious about this uh, lesson and, and all this kind of thing, and it, it gets rid of the idea of uh, bad people, and it's, you know, what do you mean the health problem? What do you mean a health sector? You know, these guys. So, um, you know, it's, it's still quote unquote new, so, um, you know, where are the best places? It shifts. You know, there's suddenly, there's like a really super program going on in a new place. And uh, so, it is, as far as Chicago goes, you know, I, I think that, you know, this, this city could benefit from uh, more of this. Um, and uh, we're here to help. And <laughs> I mean, this is where we started. We've been in a lot of, the Cure Bounce is in a lot of demand from a lot of places. And, you know, there's another thing, too. Is uh, is the how do how does one look at this? 
Is, the, is this looked at as competitive or is it looked at as synergistic? And, you know, this is synergistic with whatever, you know, law enforcement strategies are improving everywhere. Law enforcement is getting more enlightened. Law enforcement, you know, despite everything that everybody's seeing, you know, they're trying to do a better job. We want them to do a better job. But it's, it's not fair to think that that's the only thing. So motor vehicle fatalities. You don't just do speed limits and, like, have a sign every five steps and get the speed limit down to five miles an hour. There's only so far you can go with that. You got to do something else. You divide the highways, you know, to prevent the head-ons. You know, the, you make a car safer. You put seatbelts, reduce drunk driving. Got to do something else. So you approach the. We're just a different angle into this problem. Yeah, that's right. We've got time for I think one more. They're gonna, they're gonna kill me. Okay, right in the back there, on the left. You, yes. Thanks. My question is mostly for Harry Walgreens, but I'd be curious to know what everybody thinks about this. You made a passing reference to health care reform, and um, I'm sure everyone in this room is aware that we're you know, a few weeks away from right. a major U.S. Supreme Court decision that could have the unfortunate effect of kicking uh, millions of people off of their newly acquired health insurance. Obviously, we hope not, but right. could right. have that impact. And the majority, overwhelming majority, um, of the newly insured are in cities. Um, so my question is, what is the private sector doing to prepare for that possibility? Um, the possibility that many, many people, you know, will not be able to make their 12 trips to Walgreens to get their right, diabetes right. medication if they can't afford right. it. Right. It's a very um, good question and also a very difficult question because there is no one single way to prepare and there's no macro solution for that. Uh, the subsidies for lower income individuals who are uh, signing up for health insurance under health care reform is really the issue that's at stake, right? It's not the entire concept of health care reform or providing access to insurance through exchanges, but it's the subsidy that the government provides for lower income individuals that I believe the court is uh, deciding on. Um, the worst case scenario, if that gets uh, struck down and it's felt to be uh, non-constitutional, the implication uh, certainly will be that the premiums for many individuals will go up that will cause one of two things. The folks that choose to continue to purchase health insurance under health care reform will have less uh, money to spend on things, whether it be health care or food or entertainment or anything. They're going to have to spend more money on their insurance to maintain it, which is not a good thing. Others may choose not to purchase uh, insurance because it just gets too costly. For us as a company, we can't solve those prob those macro problems, obviously. Uh, they're very big if, if they occur. What we continue to do, and the merger we just had with in January uh, with um, Allianz Boots is uh, helping us with this, is we're now large, uh, arguably the largest purchaser of medications of drugs in the world across our combined organization. And that gives us purchasing power to try to drive down the cost by which we obtain medications and drugs, which enables us to continue to try to offer these as cost effectively to the population as we can. We've also made a commitment to reduce the costs of what we're spending to maintain our infrastructure. And our uh, acting CEO, Stefano Piscina, who was the chairman at Boots, uh, went public uh, a few months ago, uh, maybe a little less than that, by stating that we're going to reduce our infrastructure costs, our corporate costs across the whole company by $1.5 billion by 2017. And that's a response to try to keep our costs down so that we can continue to be cost effective to consumers and to patients. So I don't think we can solve the legal issues. Hopefully we won't have to, and that won't happen. But I think what we can continue to try to do is to be very cost effective and to uh, use our, our purchasing power to try to keep the cost of the drugs down so we can help our, our, our patients and our consumers still have access to health care. It's a I very wish, complicated question. I wish we could hear from the rest of the panel on that, but they've been so strict about time and we're going to have to end it here. But I do want to say this has been an absolutely fantastic panel. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much.
Okay, thank, thank you again to our, our panel and to our, our fantastic moderator, uh, Megan Murphy of the Financial Times, and thanks to all of you uh, for being here this afternoon. Um, just some quick instructions. Uh, the shuttles will be outside to take you to your hotels. Uh, for those of you who are attending dinner tonight, you should have gotten all the emailed instructions, so hopefully you know what to do. Um, and then for all the forum delegates who are sending session, attending sessions at the Art Institute tomorrow morning, uh, breakfast starts at 7.30 a.m. in the Grand Foyer, which is the Michigan Avenue entrance, the opposite from where we were this morning. And the first panel on arts and culture starts at 8.30 a.m. sharp in Rubloff Auditorium, which is where we were this morning. So thank you all again, and one more round of applause for our, our panelists and moderators.